William Burroughs' The Naked Lunch changed the face of the 1950s. American writing would never be the same again. Their spirit of social, sexual and chemical freedom created the idea of a beat generation. But what's become of that generation now? The poet, novelist and beat collector Ian Sinclair takes to the road to find out in Generating the Beats. It's the beat generation, it's bayat. It's the beat to keep, it's the beat of the heart. It's being beat and down in the world and like old time low down. And like in ancient civilizations, the slave boatmen rowing galleys to a beat and servants spinning pottery to a beat. Back in the 50s, I was too callow to measure time in generations, unaware that these years were supposed to be gray, paranoid, hidden from the light by a giant mushroom cloud. A decade of wars and secret cancers. It still came as a shock, a jolt to drowsy consciousness, to be handed a copy of Jack Kerouac's paperback novel, Maggie Cassidy, in its gaudy panther edition. The cover was an adolescent's wet dream, a raven-haired beauty in the black stockings and the off-the-shoulder flower print dress, lolling back, lips parted, eyes shut on a bed of hay. Tremors of horror may run through our retrospective sexual politicians, the gender police, but not then, not in the era of life-sized Bridget Bardos given away with copies of Ravalli. Kerouac's tender-hearted romanticism, the long improvisatory breath lines, his solipsism was a one-hit addiction. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast and all that road going and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it. In Iowa, I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. The rush of Kerouac's language, photographed so well, played in the mind's eye, its rhythms and resonances, its lists, and exotic place names. I searched out copies of On the Road, The Subterraneans, and The Dharma Bums. Kerouac was our guide and mentor, the prophet suburban lads read before they took off for the city. I kept my enthusiasm under wraps. Even today, it's not quite respectable. In the dead years of the 70s and the materialist helter-skelter of the 80s, the beats were irredeemably out of fashion. At this point, the secret magazines crept into being. The Kerouac Connection, published by the scholarly Dave Moore out of Bristol. And later, from the Coventry suburbs, Kevin Ring's Beat Scene. Beginning our quest for the last whispers of the Beat heritage, we took a train one cold, wet afternoon for Coventry. Kevin Ring was upstairs, cheerful, but not quite well, like most ex-teachers. Kevin has been there, visited Lau, Kerouac's hometown. He's been on the receiving end of sinister phone calls from members of the Kerouac estate, fingering him as the source of elusive pirate editions. The estate is now heavy business with a six-figure annual turnover. Relics are traded, deals struck with museums and celebrity collectors. Johnny Depp had bought Jack Kerouac's old famous raincoat for $15,000. And the story is that the shoes were a part of the, the deal. The owner of the raincoat, on being told that there was a handkerchief in the pocket, um, exclaimed, hell, I could have got another $5,000 for that. I mean, I don't think it matters about raincoats and shoes, but, Possibly, but if it's yeah. happening with manuscripts and, and unpublished material, then it would be sort of serious, wouldn't it? They could possibly be important, because I remember being in Lowell, I, I can't remember the exact date now, a friend there said, do you want to see something? And I said, sure. He pulled out this huge box from a cupboard. This was from a council office in Lowell. And he pulled this typewriter out. And I said, that's not what I think it is, is it? And he says, read the name. It says Underwood. And it was Jack Kerouac's typewriter, a huge machine, you know. And then he said, do you want to see something else? And I says, yeah, while we're at it, yeah, why not? I pulled this other box out from another cupboard and... Uh, 
there was the rucksack of all rucksacks, you know, the, the holy grail of, of rucksacks, and uh, complete with an old wine bottle, corkscrews, a box of motel matches, the lot, you know. And I says, is that, is that it? I says, can I put it on? He says, sure, put it on. So there I was with Jack Kerouac's rucksack, you know, a huge thing, big thing, you know, maybe the one that he was at Bixby Canyon with and on the road. So these things are important to as much as, say, Ezra Pound's suit or Auden's typewriter or what have you. I belong to the B generation. I don't let anything trouble my mind. I belong to the B generation. And everything's going just fine. Oh, oh man, poetry and jazz are... If there ever was such a thing as the B generation, on which all the accused members plead the Fifth Amendment, then it happened in New York in the 40s. Mention the dreaded words, and most of the suspects twitch into a rictus of denial. Having a dark, beat past is like going up before Joe McCarthy. It began in and around Columbia University, a loose social grouping that got involved with the usual urban bohemian stuff. The core group were, or would become, writers. Kerouac, Ginsburg, Burroughs. A tag was needed, a label that would align these literary invisibles with previous marketable periods and locations. Paris in the 20s, the Bloomsbury group, who they came with the passing of years to resemble. Allen Ginsberg, from his base on the Lower East Side, was always chairman of the board for Beats, Inc. Burroughs and I shared an apartment with his wife, and Carol came in on weekends and hung around. So there was already a little group of friends without any intention of becoming a generation or pretension of that kind. John Clellan Holmes, who was a good friend of Kerouac's and mine, and who knew Neil Cassidy, had an apartment on uh, Lexington Avenue in 56. And we used to rendezvous there quite a bit. And he and Kerouac in 1948 got into a conversation about the lost generation and Fitzgerald, Hemingway. And Holmes, a more sort of literary, historical-minded, said, I wonder what the name for our generation or this generation will be. And Kerouac didn't think there was one. To unname it, he said, ah, it's a B generation. There's nothing, there's no big uh, glamour name for it. So four years later, John Cleland Holmes, the novelist, wrote an article in the New York Times Literary Weekend, the magazine section, uh, saying, this is the B generation was entitled, quoting Kerouac, but mostly putting it in terms of juvenile delinquency and rebellion, which was the opposite of Kerouac's notion of, of some sort of lamb like everything belongs to me because I am poor. That's, yeah. That was his slogan. I'd been ducking it for years, but finally the moment had arrived. Too many of the beats were unsponsored off the road. We would have to take our quest to America to find them. <laughs> The car that brings us from the airport is driven by a large, cheerful Afro-Caribbean lady used to shuttling all sorts of dubious cargoes, unused to the one-way flow of traffic. She dumps us on the pavement, some way short of the Paramount Hotel. This is just off Times Square, media-friendly, discount to TV crews who look like TV crews. The in-house newspaper stall carries nothing but antique cigarettes, and copies of Burroughs' Ghosts of Chance. This is the Philippe Stark version of the infamous Beat Hotel at 9 Rue Gite Le Coeur. Low aquarium lighting, blackboards behind the beds, a thin white cupboard with an Osiris eye that opens to reveal a multi-channel color TV set. At first, it rains solidly and we go backwards and forwards between the hotel and the MTV-sponsored beat show at the Whitney Museum, whose all-inclusive kleptomania signal the end of the thing it celebrates. En route, the cab driver's speed freak rap points out the spot where John Lennon was shot or where they filmed Rosemary's Baby. In the central area of this extremely well-laid-out exhibition is a point where you can take a journey to New York, to Los Angeles or to San Francisco. You make your own decision and you walk through the various rooms. And in the hallway itself, there's a spread that chronologically 
lists the history of the beat generation year by year with photographs and setting it against current events. And here's a, a cinema that's showing the Burroughs cut-up films, all the lost ephemera and a wall of photographs of history that begins with a picture of Herbert Hunky in a cold water hotel bedroom having just shot up and moves to the, one of the most sacred icons of the whole beat generation, which is the original teletype scroll on which Jack Kerouac typed out on the road. And looking at it is fascinating because the names of the original characters unchanged. And you can see that it wasn't really a piece of fiction, but uh, an account taken straight from life. Because Dean Moriarty, in the first sentence, is now just referred to as Neil. I first met Neil not long after my father died, followed by the three dot, dot, dots, which are taken from Celine. And the paper itself has now got a waxy, golden quality, like a holy Buddhist scroll and it's boxed in perspex, like one of Damien Hirst's animals. And even to think about a price for it would be terrifying. It's chipped and broken and peeled away, and people will come and look at it reverently and imagine those lost times. A face like Hunky's in New York. Hunky, whom you'll see on Times Square, somnolent and alert, sad, sweet, and dark, holy, just out of jail, martyred, tortured by sidewalks, starved for sex and companionship, open to anything, ready to introduce a new world with a shrug. Herbert Hunky's face is the first one seen through the door of the Whitney, and any investigation of the Beats would have to begin with the living Hunky at the Chelsea Hotel. Hunky had been christened with the same humour that makes Lofty a dwarf. He's no steroidal beach boy, he's an energised spectre, but he was the original connection, the Virgil to the Times Square underworld. His life was a beat audition. Of course, I was a new cup of tea for these college students. They just didn't know how to pass me. They weren't sure but what I wasn't a new species, you know? They were kind of amazed to discover that I had managed to maintain some sort of a personality and I kept myself well, I'm vain, I always have been, and it wasn't too difficult to keep myself looking, as we say now, sharp, <laughs> and uh, all that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of things about me. Uh, just my being on the scene startled them in a way. You gave them language? I, I gave them a lot of things. Passing I mean, even terms like beat, I believe, you, oh, you, you kind of introduced them to. Yes, they had never heard it used as as frequently as I used it and since I meant it to cover weariness and disgust and frustration and anxiety what we call stress these days I used it quite a bit <laughs> Jesus I'm beat man I'm so tired Hunky was a new species a con man small-time thief rumored to be one of the great storytellers Hunky lives in a neat box on one of the upper floors. He keeps the room at hothouse temperature, like the conservatory in the big sleep. He needs warmth for his skeletal frame, moves delicately, speaks with a strong voice that doesn't belong in such an X-ray skin suit. He takes regular hits from a bottle of sweet, fizzy syrup. He's a gracious lizard, fist clenched and raised, untroubled by memory or expectation of death. Effortlessly, he calls up the visions of his youth, the eternal present tense of New York in the 40s. He introduced William Burroughs to dope. The fellow that had had the place as a sublet had been working up near Columbia at a drugstore, a soda fountain. I guess Bill had spotted him and got into the habit of talking with him over the counter every day, knowing uh, the fellow that had the place, his name was Bob Brandenburg, and Bob uh, had always had dreams of being a, a big-time operator of some sort. And so when Burroughs, in passing, commented about having a sawed-off shotgun that he'd like to sell, Bob's ears picked right up, and he said, well, I'm expecting a friend of mine to return from a trip and he'd be your best bet. Well, that's what happened. We got in that 
day and that evening uh, knock at the door and there he stood Chesterfield overcoat gray fedora hat snapped down over one eye or just so let me put it that way collar velvet collar neatly in place pair of gloves clutched in his hand also very reserved and you know colorless so to speak I thought, oh boy, if this isn't heat, I've never seen it. <laughs> well, I guess I'd never seen it because he was anything but heat. And that's the way we met. The buyer spreads terror throughout the industry. Junkies and agents disappear. Like a vampire bat, he gives off a narcotic effluvium, a dank green mist that anesthetizes his victims and renders them helpless in his enveloping presence. And once he is scored, he holds up for several days like a gorged bull constrictor. Finally, he's caught in the act of digesting the narcotics commissioner and destroyed with a flamethrower. I helped give him his first shot. Everybody wants to know that for some reason. But he wasn't coerced. He wasn't uh, led to believe that it was something that he would love he was a natural. <laughs> he had uh, been uh, enamored to some extent by De Quincey and Oakham Dreams. Stories that he'd read, I guess any little bit that spoke of being able to break the chains, you know. That's what it gets down to. It wasn't easy to make contact with Gregory Corso. The phone calls went back and forth clinic days, museum days. Corso lives a couple of flights up with a pair of book dealers who run a book room haven for semi-retired beats. Columbia University Poetry Reading, 1975. Prologue. What a 16 years it's been since last sat I here with the chillings again seated, he older, sweetly sadder, she broader, unmotherly still. With all my poet friends, ex-wife and forever daughter, with all my hair and broken nose and teeth no longer there, and good old Karawaki poofed into fat air, eternal spirit of the age, a monumental loss, another angel chased from the American door. And what the gains? Al volleyed amongst Hindu gods and traded them all for Buddha's no gods. A Guggenheim he got, an NBA award, an elect of the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And the New York Times paid him $400 for a poem he wrote about being mugged for $60. <laughs> oh, blessed fortune, for his life there is no thief. Gregory is the Joe Pecci of the Beat Generation, a flute of energy. He refuses to talk sitting down. He prison paces the small apartment. I had come out of Dannemora, the heaviest prison in New York State, huh? 19 years old. Huh? Dig it. I learned a lot there. Better than going to Andover and Exeter and Nichols, man. What I learned there was three things. First thing they told me was, don't take your shoes off. You know what that means? You're walking right out. You ain't got no time at all. Two to three years is bullshit. All right. The second thing they told me, don't you serve time, let time serve you. Now, what does that mean? That means I ate up the, the dictionaries, I ate up the library. The whole thing, I read all the books, everything. Shelley Stand, oh, Shell, definitely in there, you know. But Standard Dictionary, 1905 edition, this fat, with all the archaic and obsolete beautiful words that I use in poetry. I wish the Oxford Dictionary people will save all the archaic and obsolete words in one dictionary. In one dictionary. The third thing that made me come out the poet was this. I've seen the la uh, there were three things. Don't take your shoes off. Don't you serve time, let time serve you. And this was the last one. It was the guy who never spoke to me. And he was the head of the mafioso there. He said, look, when you go out there and you're talking to two people, make sure you see three. So I looked at him, I said, <laughs> you know, to get it, of course, dig yourself. 
understand that you're there and what you're doing. At 66, Corso is the youngest of the daddies, the founding fathers, still worried that the literary brokers are nudging him out of the picture. This is a funny one. I think they're trying to knock me out of it. I think they want a triplicity. They want a Burroughs, a Ginsburg, and a Kerouac. I don't think they want a Corso in it. So a triplicity is better than a quadruple. It's simpler. It hit me, though, and you want to know my feelings about it. It was in Newsweek magazine. They had this picture of Kerouac, Burroughs, Ginsburg, and me. And they mentioned the names of the three and not mine. Like I was some kind of uh, thing on the side there. The Marx Brothers, you, yeah. you were, you were Right, right, Zeppo, <laughs> right. Little did they know that I was the early one at the battlefields, man. Corso's hot to authenticate his visionary status. All the beats had their defining moment. Most famously, Ginsburg hearing the voice of Blake while masturbating in Harlem, looking for a confirmation that they were the chosen, the nominated messengers. My vision was hotter than your vision. I had it in Europe. I had it in the Isle of Crete. The funny thing about it was it connected with a thing when I left prison, I went back to live in Greenwich Village where I was born. And I'm sitting facing a wall and there's a knock, knock. I said, come in, and then it caught me. I realized I locked the door and the door opened. The door opened and the thing that came in was this light, skinless light. And it had a form, it had a form, and it was like pointing at me, and that was it. And I got a reshot of it in Crete. So I wrote a letter to Ginsburg right away, and I made a big mistake there because I don't think he ever forgave me. I said, I think Burroughs saw it. I saw it. Did you see it? Wow. That letter I received in return. I don't know whatever happened to it, but he was very upset, very upset. Because his vision was jerking off. He was jerking off and he had heard Blake. And what did Blake say to him? Niente, no word. Yeah, my no word either. But I know at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't go to sleep. I know it. Till this day, I'm so confused by it. Corso tricks time, he ages the young, is generous enough to continue to behave disgracefully, to barrack poetry readings. Hearing that we're going to see Burroughs next, he tells us that we'll get some good hunting. Then he stops the interview to write Burroughs a letter that he wants us to deliver. We cruised into Lawrence, Kansas in our hired car, the dead heart of America, a small university town so normal it was freakish, a pod person dormitory. Prepare to enter a new dimension, says a shop hawking t-shirts and new age skateboards. 30 minute parking, drug free school zone, announces the sign outside an otherwise unremarkable red brick building. We locate the Burroughs bungalow, boxcar red clapboard with neat white balcony in a sleepy wooded avenue but have some time to put on before the interview. This has now become part of the grand tour. Henry James in reverse. Stop off to have your portrait taken with old Bill. He doesn't have to say anything. Samuel Beckett acknowledged that he was a writer. What more can anyone add? In New York, mega agents fix the deals. He sampled on CDs. Lolling in a wheelchair, he promotes Nike footwear. He's becoming the voice of the century, a gravel whisper. The planet Earth has been invaded. This is war to extermination. The entire planet is infected by virus weapons of the enemy. The enemy is in you, controlling thought, feeling, and apparent sensory impressions. It's a privilege of which we're aware to be here, to be admitted to the presence. In truth, we don't want to say anything, ask any questions, just sit for a while. And that's what I'm feeling as we try to find something edible in the EZ food store, a kind of service station that doesn't serve. The woman at the till stares open-mouthed at these aliens and then goes back to spooning in the goo 
from a bucket-sized tub. She's so fat, she'd have to be lifted out of the chair. Saturday shoppers waddle in to pick up their gun magazines and root beer, a couple of jumbo cheeseburgers to hold them until they roll back into the car. You need a special key on a massive chain to use the gents. In the bowl floats a paleolithic turd the size of a truncheon. Burroughs settles himself to field our questions, a little hard of hearing, from behind the safety of a table. He likes to talk property and prices. It's totally unreal. This must be a hologram. What could persuade the globe-trotting Burroughs to settle in Lawrence, Kansas? You see, I was born in St. Louis, just 200 miles from here. My trees and water and, and prices that are reasonable. I lived around, I've been in, uh, I spent a year in Boulder, oh my God, now. Boomtown, prices going up. Like when I was first there, I had a three-room apartment. Yes, no, yeah, two-room, nice apartment, fully furnished. And that was 160 a month. By the time I left, a little more than a year later, it was already 300 going up. Probably up to 600 by now, at least. So, just the Midwest are one by default. And once you're settled anywhere, it's very difficult to move. Cats. Do you think place has any real importance? It's just. Will you carry it's having less and less importance, of course. The quicker you can get somewhere, the less point there is in going there. Now, there used to be, you know, that, that, that Paris was the place to be, London was the place to be, Shanghai, Tangier. Doesn't seem to be true anywhere anymore. Wasn't this the part of the world for in cold blood, that? Uh, yes, yes. Was that something in Kansas? Yes. Uh, Just driving down those roads? I no, remember. that was... Uh, the, uh, the further west you go, the worse it gets. Deteriorates. Now, when you get way out there on the, in the heart of the wheat land, it's really dull. Dull looking people do. You didn't see the show in New York in the Whitney, the young people? No, I didn't, no. No, but it's quite a strange experience to go around that exhibition and see things like Kerouac's typescript is in a perspex box, like a holy relic. <laughs> I know they're selling them off piece by piece. Yeah. Shoes. <laughs> Johnny Depp bought a raincoat for what? fifty thousand dollars. What? Yeah. yeah. Kerouac's raincoat. Is that true? It's true. Because yeah. there's, there's like there's a fuss about Allen Ginsberg's archive selling for a million dollars, but there's a lot of material in there. That's oh, a real. Yes, you know, there's a lot of material. It's, it's a real thing. Yeah. But then the Kerouac family. And then they sell shoes and stuff like that. <laughs> raincoat. Raincoat. A raincoat and a briefcase and a hat. <laughs> It was $50,000. Yeah. <laughs> See, you got, so to shout, tell your shoes. And you're... Well, I've got quite a few clothes in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose they'll do advantage. <clears throat> Burroughs hasn't aged. He's weathered like a Chinese root, an axe in a call of flesh, cicatrice mouth, mirror eyes that have seen so much it would turn you to stone if you stared too deeply into them, you'd know some small part of what he knows. The whole business of the interview, the visit, is beautifully stage-managed. It has a shape and a form. Burroughs shows his paintings, the books, nice, bright, unopened gifts on the shelf. Most of the time, he re-reads Hemingway, Conrad. A huge cat that looks like it feeds on small cattle sleeps on the master's sunny bed. We go outside stroll around the estate, the goldfish pond, burrows poking at the water with his cane, the sentry box organ accumulator, like an outside privy. We pose for the routine snap. It was the fantastic drowse and drum, hum, of lum, mum, afternoon, nath and the dew. Old Frisco with end of land sadness. The people the alley full of trucks and cars of businesses nearabouts. Nobody knew or far from cared who I was all my life, 3,500 miles from birth all opened up and at last belonged to me in great America. And now it's night in Third Street. Flying to San Francisco over Salt Lake City, the producer was stuck between two Mormon missionaries. Do they have Negroes in your country? 
Now everything happens more slowly. Time to walk up and down the hills, sample the second-hand bookshops. The process of locating and fixing interviews with the poets is also a more leisured affair, especially for them. Lawrence Ferlinghetti doesn't come into the office above City Lights, the bookshop and publishing concern he founded in the early 50s at regular hours. We just have to keep trying. Meanwhile, we wandered the city. Odd cul-de-sacs and avenues that nobody is much bothered about have been re-dignified with the names of poets and writers. Via Ferlinghetti, Jack Kerouac Street. Ferlinghetti has recovered from heart surgery and moves easily about his kingdom. In his thick wool sweater, he's tall, quietly ironic, comes on like a ferry boat captain. He's seen it all, from an oblique angle, from the high cabin. And he's come through the obscenity trials, the continual hassles of media tourism. The, the old tradition in San Francisco was, for the writers was really anarchist and, uh, and dissident. And uh, in uh, particularly this part of town, which is known as North Beach, where the beats were concentrated. And this was an old Italian anarchist colony. When we first opened up the bookstore, we used to sell Italian anarchist newspapers. A man in baggy pants and a derby would come by on the garbage truck and run in and get his Italian anarchist newspaper. <laughs> One of the local scavengers. Did Hull get its first reading in San Francisco, the oh, Sixth yes. Gallery? Mm -hmm. And uh, I went home after the reading. I didn't know the poets well enough to hang out with them after the reading, really. So I went home and I sent Allen Ginsberg a telegram, which was, uh, um, it echoed what Emerson had written to Whitman when he received the first copy of Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which was, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. And I added, when do we get the manuscript? I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the stars. If it hadn't been for Allen Ginsberg, there wouldn't be any beat generation. He, he fabricated the whole thing out of his own imagination and more power to him. <laughs> Glory to Allen Ginsberg. So, so he turned it into a kind of business operation like the Beats Inc. Mm, well, no. <laughs> right. Definitely still not business. A mythology. He, he mythologized. Business it. not as usual. I mean, it's, st it's still the only rebellion around. If you look around the, the writers in the English speaking world, who is raising a rebellious voice these days? I don't hear anybody. There was no beat generation. It's simply the most effective way of marketing a period. Ginsburg's vast cache of letters and journals, locks of hair, images, an insane avalanche of stalled time is sold for more than a million dollars to Stanford University. Ginsburg's pitch has been accepted by the Academy. The wild men have been dragged in from the street. Ginsburg won a Pulitzer Prize a Guggenheim Fellowship and has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Burroughs wears his Academy badge like a Rotarian in the lapel of his favorite old sports jacket. These were the themes I brooded on as I tried to jump the streams on the Oakland freeway in my aquamarine Hertz rental car. We swerved off this mad highway and into scrapyard Oakland. Strung out garbage men gaped at our request for directions. Panther types in black berets mimicked the producer's limey accent. A few miles changed the whole picture. Michael McClure's retreat in the foothills had a deck that overlooked a pleasant stretch of tamed forest, Surrey with sunshine. McClure is a very elegant dude, East Coast Pacific cool. His art, a thing of deeply held breath, body poetics, measured movement, McClure hung out with Jim Morrison, Bob Dylan. His play, The Beard, directed by Rip Torn, brought all London, including Sir Ralph Richardson, to the Royal Court Theatre. Now, 
he's webbed up with Ray Manzarak of The Doors. He lays aside the thick copy of Webster's plays that he's been perusing in a window seat and spins us a few tracks from his Love Lion CD. We are gifted with a copy each, and none the worse for the inevitable gouge of the remainder discount store. There's a bloody war outside that's whistling through the wound, stretching out to someone in a dream. It's no dream, stretching out to Mama Lion in a dream. So McClure has reinvented himself for each generation. He was fit, working out, years before it was compulsory. He puts a canny, retrospective spin on the ecological concerns of the Beats, so that the stuff that he and Gary Snyder read all those years ago at the Sixth Gallery, where Howell was performed publicly for the first time, is seen as a move to step outside of the disaster that we've wreaked upon the environment and upon our phylogenetic selves. Much of what the Beat generation is about is nature, he affirms. What happened in 1955 at the Sixth Gallery reading was this thing that had been called the Beat Generation that is, for my money, very, I like it, it's okay, it's good, it's real good. It's got great writers like Jack and Alan, but it was an urban guy phenomenon. And what happened in 1955 with Howell, with what I did, with what Gary did, is I felt like we were doing something important. I felt like we, in retrospect, I didn't think this at the time, I knew we were doing, that the reading was primarily nature poetry at that event. But now, in retrospect, I'd say, oh, cool. We are the literary wing of the environmental movement. McClure has continued his relentless pursuit of the clarity of vision and visionary renewal as a discipline, as an extension of the pine floors, the bright windows, the neat bookshelves. Peyote buttons are a natural tool not for the derangement of the senses, but in pursuit of the higher madness of mammal identity, the chanting to lions in the San Francisco Zoo. Regarding defining moments of vision in my life, I can think of two in my early life. One would be the experience with peyote I had in 1957 after being given five peyote buttons by the artist Wallace Berman and meeting George Herms, who's seen in the Whitney show during that time and writing a long poem, a kind of para-journalistic poem in which there was a sort of uh, total recall of the experience writing that the next day. So I have that moment of illumination and uh, the moment of speaking it with me also. Another moment of a uh, similar moment would be reading a poem of mine in what's called Beast Language to four lions at the San Francisco Zoo and having them roar back as I read the poem to them. Actually, I had to shout the poem to them. Then, that was played on the radio here, on the Pacifica radio stations here. I remember driving across the bridge one day and hearing it. Then, films were being done about young American poets, and this was about 1964, and uh, WNETV came to me and said they'd uh, like to do a film on me, and by the way, they'd heard me reading with the lions, and would the lions do it again for film camera? And I said, I don't know. So we went out there and did it, and they sure did. They did it a couple of times for the cameras. Oh. And as much as that would be a defining moment of illumination, having read to the lion several times, which means, you know, the lion is the loudest mammal being that we know of. And certainly the lion for me represents consciousness, not nature red in tooth and claw, but nature sharp in neuron and keen in the, in the sinews of uh, the central nervous system, among other things as much as those readings was the time that I made uh, 50 copies of the first original reading to give to friends as a poet's gift, which meant putting them on a little old-fashioned tape, a little wind-up audio tape. And I had a machine that would uh, do copy five tapes at a time at the Tape Music Center. And I went over there, and so I never thought to turn the machine down. So I listened to the reading ten times in a row. And all of the reading is only four minutes long or so. It's, I was playing it very loudly. And then I walked outside the Tape Music Center and looked up at the sky, and the sky went, Grah! 
Across America, the path between the various beet luminaries has been beaten so flat that you're always aware of the next German or Dutch film crew waiting in the doorway. Is this the bunch working on the Kinsey Report documentary or a roundup of telegenic poets for Channel 4? There are enough time travellers hacking their way back to the 50s to fill the Albert Hall. Is there anything to be learnt out there? Hasn't it all been coughed up already? Recorded, re-recorded, sampled, merchandised in the Western way? The energy vampires have sucked the husk dry. I don't like to hear the word vampire around uh, here. Uh, Trying to improve our public image. <laughs> But I'm still a believer. I'm happy to go back to the texts, to the excited rush of the prose, the documentary celebration of period in all its tastes and sounds and odors, the formidable directness of the poetry. Perhaps we should have stayed at home, bought a ticket up the northern line to Belsize Park. That's where Carolyn Cassidy, widow of the legendary Neil, girlfriend of Jack Kerouac, is now to be found. It's where she curates her own small, lived-in museum of beat history. The chalk drawings that didn't make it to the Whitney. The shrine of heroic photographs, unused in advertising portfolios. The first edition of On the Road with Neil's signature, the Roman Coppola script for the Francis Ford Coppola production. That's where she now questions the official Allen Ginsberg party line. I think Alan is getting a bit out of line more and more up at Hampstead when he was doing a signing and a reading. Some guy got up in the audience and, s and asked about if Neil and Jack were homosexual, you know, and Alan says yes. And I wanted to tell the guy, ask me that question, you know. It's getting so far from what it really was. And of course, Jack and Neil were never interested in it anyway. Ginsburg uh, invented the whole Beat Generation thing. Even Ferlinghetti agrees with that. And uh, Jack and Neil were just drawn into it because of Alan, but they were never sympathetic with any of the things that uh, Alan stands for or the whole thing now has come down to. And the people that are involved are so remote from uh, anything except Alan, you know. It's all his uh, way he thinks and the kind of quality he sees in things. Whereas uh, Jack kept complaining, uh, saying it had nothing to do with that. Carolyn is an Anglophile, a fan of our own Holy Trinity, Alan Bennett, Jonathan Miller, Peter Aykroyd. She grew up on extracts of Dickens and games of poo sticks, was moving towards an orthodox career in stage design and the liberal arts when her trajectory intersected with Neil Cassidy. And therefore, she catches it from both sides. The feminist professors yelp when she admits that she had a certain relish for kitchen life. She enjoyed pouring out the coffee for Neil and Jack. The wild men revile her as a ball breaker, a party pooper. What most people forget is the period that uh, how really old fashioned we all were. And that's the, the big thing about the plays and things there. It's all the 80s and 90s consciousness. not. 50s, and for both men who had started Catholics, and then uh, and Jack had the immigrants' uh, influence as well, they were so conventional, really. I mean, everybody then expected that the end of life would be a home and family, and even Ginsburg expected that to begin with. And so these two guys, that was the ultimate. And Jack, occasionally he'd have flashes about how he couldn't do that, but that was still the ideal. Carolyn asserts, and I'm sure she's right, that the dream of family life was always there for the neurotically restless searchers of the beat generation. The urge to be gone, moving, and then almost immediately the need to find a place anywhere to sit and think and do the work. So that these home wreckers, junkies, transgressors, con men visionaries, were also in their modest egotism, the most straightforward and honest citizens of the Republic, the true Americans. I once knew a man who worked from nine to five just to pay his monthly bills was why he stayed alive. So keep your country cottage, your house and lawn so green. 
I just want a one-room pad where I can make the scene. So out it's in. I belong to the B generation. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyites? America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send your eggs to India? I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? America, after all, it is you and I who are perfect, not the next world. The Sunday feature, Generating the Beats, was presented by Ian Sinclair and the producer was Paul Quinn.